Good. All right. So, yeah, as I was saying, uh, put adjoints in the title because uh, Justin has discouraged me to talk too much about adjoints. Why? Because he says from his interactions with industry and government, people find um, adjoints scary. So maybe they think it's something like this, <laughs> right? Let's do some adjoints. Uh, so I want to dispel that, and I want you to look at adjoints more like this. All right, so you're gonna find some superpowers here with the adjoint method. Um, it's not a scary word, I don't think, so. And uh, <clears throat> just to rewind a bit, you know, go back uh, 20 years, it was, um, yeah, over 20 years ago uh, for my PhD thesis, um, and uh, took about a year to decide what research to do, and uh, decide to put together two bodies of work that I admired much at the time. One was the uh, adjoint method used for aerodynamic shape optimization, um, pioneered by Jamieson, and then my co-advisor, Juan Alonso, uh, did quite a bit of work on it as well. And the other one uh, is a preliminary or conceptual aircraft design uh, using low fidelity models, but using more disciplines, using aerodynamics and structures and weights and so on. Um, and at the time, uh, Sean Wakayama just graduated. It wrote a wonderful thesis. Um, I encourage you all to, if you haven't read it, go back and, and read that. It's a nice, very nice piece of work, all done from scratch. And it takes you through an evolution of a wing, de uh, wing designs done with MDO with increasing number of models and constraints. Um, and, and that really inspired me to put the two things together. So I wanted to do uh, this kind of design, but with high fidelity CFT based. And that eventually, after a few years, <laughs> uh, a bit of pain, a lot of pain, um, led to the first uh, CFT based aerostructure optimization where we're optimizing aerodynamic shape and um, structural sizing simultaneously. And the example was a, a business jet. Uh, and this was 20 years, almost to the day, to the month that I defended, actually, right? So the MDO lab now is 20 years this year. Um, at the time, uh, I also identified Python as the language of the future, right? Uh, was a bit of a bet. Python was in its infancy. Um, and uh, I decided I didn't want uh, when I became a faculty, I wasn't going to uh, use the code that I had before. It was a monolithic, all Fortran code. Okay, so imagine coupling aerodynamic structures, all, so on, all with Fortran, file I/O, and everything, um, and the integration with the optimizer. Uh, I really thought there would be a better way to modularize this, uh, wrap each module on a higher level language, and then do the scripting at the higher level with Python. And at the time, I tried Perl, Java, not JavaScript, JavaScript didn't exist then, Java, uh, C++, F. Fortran, of course, was the default. Um, and MATLAB, right? And I decided Python was it, right? Uh, again, uh, it was a bit of a bet, and it, it did uh, pay off. Um, so I had this plan to do this framework. This is the slide I showed at the end of my thesis, and also for my interview my first faculty position. And um, some of this actually happened, okay? And some of, some, some of it is ongoing so many years later. Um, but the question now is how to do this, right? Um, so uh, one of the other things that came out of my thesis was um, I uh, found out the complex step method was very useful. Um, read a paper about it and then uh, question myself whether this was generalizable because the paper only had a very simple analytic problem. Um, so I tried it on a finite element code and eventual CFD and eventually the whole coupled framework was complexified. Was that useful for optimization? No, because the cost is still prohibitive. But it was extremely useful to verify all the gradients I was computing with a coupled adjoint, right? Um, so that whole optimization was thanks made possible by the coupled adjoint. Without the coupled adjoint, uh, wouldn't have been able to do it, all right? Uh, now, for the second version of the framework, um, this took um, several years in the MDO lab. Many students uh, 
basically uh, got a CFD code from Stanford called um, SUMB, uh, structured code, uh, that then we made the overset, develop an adjoint for it. That was the initial work. Um, then on the structures, uh, Graham came and saved the day with, uh, or saved the decade, I should say, with the tax. Um, and we coupled tax to this uh, aerodynamic solver, developed a coupled adjoint, um, and then had our first applications. All of this I had demonstrated uh, in my thesis, but this was, uh, I think, something like 10 times more efficient, okay? Um, and more modular with Python and so on. But still, it was a, a lot of work, and even though it's modular, every time you need to add another discipline or uh, replace another, uh, replace the CFD solver with something else, it still takes a lot of work. Um, another thing we developed was the PAUP sparse, which is this common interface for um, many different optimizers. Again, it's open source, and the whole framework, Mac framework, is open source. Um, right, so this enabled us to do um, this kind of optimization. So here we have um, a uh, optimization of, I hope, the, the video. There's the video. Um, so we can optimize uh, the shape and the structural sizing simultaneously, do plan form optimization. Um, what you see there is two different results. On the left is minimizing takeoff gross weight. On the right, it's minimizing fuel burn. And you can see with the fuel burn, extends the span because the trade between drag and weight is different. It's more biased towards reducing drag. So you end up with a heavier wing that burns less fuel uh, on the left, you see a wing that is heavier, uh, or it's lighter, but burns more fuel. So it's a typical trade between fuel burn and weight of the, of the wing. Uh, with this, we also did this toe-steered uh, composite high aspect ratio wing. This was a project funded by NASA. Um, and uh, the idea there was instead of using straight composite fibers that you see there on the left, um, we optimize the toe uh, angles so that we can have curvilinear um, carbon fiber. Uh, and this is actually, can be built with automatic fiber placement machines and was indeed built by uh, Aurora Flight Sciences, a third scale model of this wing. Uh, and then they tested it at NASA Armstrong. Um, and uh, Tim, who uh, did the main work here on the design, again using tax by uh, Graham Kennedy and the whole framework. Um, he was able to see the, uh, the test. I wasn't uh, there, unfortunately. Uh, the wing didn't break, right? That's good news. And in fact, after NASA was done, um, they were going to discard it. And uh, at the University of Michigan, I convinced the chair to um, uh, basically bring it over to the to the department, and uh, we have it now installed there against the wall in our atrium at FXB in, uh, at Michigan. So these are some of the things that can be done. Now, how does that relate to open MDAO? Um, well, we all know, I think, that uh, gradient basis is only hope for large number of design variables. For these problems, I was talking about about 1,000 variables, okay? 1,000 variables takes a couple of days, maybe up to 1,000 procs on the, on the biggest cases, okay? But it's doable, right? It's expensive, but it's doable within a couple of days. Again, thanks to gradient-based optimization together with an analytic method or semi-analytic method, if you want to call it that. Um, so that's the adjoint method. You get that flatter line there um, with a lower slope. So that makes problems with large number of variables tractable. But the issue is that um, you really need to have uh, efficient uh, and robust as well, right? Um, and then there's the question of implementation. Implementation is a very, very large cost, okay? So the typical problem is uh, students in, in my lab tend to, okay, I want to get this problem just right, I'm gonna develop the model, I'm gonna do gradients and so on. Um, by the time they're done, for some problems, by the time they're done, somebody else with a genetic algorithm might already have a result, okay? That's the reality. 
So um, it takes quite a bit of implementation, right? And this is what I think OpenMDO is about, is about uh, shortening the time for uh, the development of a coupled edge joint. So uh, just a quick overview of methods for computing derivatives, right? So if you have a, a black box, all you see is input and output. You control the input, you see the output. All you can do is finite differences, maybe the complex step if the code runs in complex mode. Uh, then you open the box. You open the box, and let's say you open the box, you un understand what the equations are. So that's the column in the middle there. You know how the, sort of what the, how the solver works, what the solver solves for, what functions are computed, what the residuals are. If you know that, if you have access to that, to the residuals and the state variables, then you can uh, implement either the direct or the adjoint method, what I call analytic or semi-analytic methods. Or, uh, implicit analytic methods. Uh, and finally, all the way to the right, you have AD, automatic or algorithmic differentiation. Uh, at that level, you're looking at every single line of code. Okay, so in the middle is more of an abstraction. On the right, you're looking at literally at every single line of code. In theory, you can differentiate every single line, and you have AD. Um, so for several years, I had this idea that you could unify all this, right? You could come up with some formulation to explain all these in one equation or one framework. Uh, because so far in my course, I always explain, okay, this method, this method, that method, uh, with different symbols and so on. Um, and I would say, well, the direct method relates to the forward mode in AD, the adjoint relates to the reverse mode in AD, uh, but no more direct connection than that. Um, so, I won't go through the details of uh, this particular uh, overview, but uh, there are more details in my book in chapter six. So this desire to unify uh, these methods uh, resulted in the unified derivative equation. So um, I worked with a student of mine at the time, John Huang, who's now a uh, professor at UCSD, and um, we ended up with this equation, which is, I think, really nice and elegant, right? It's, there's a symmetry to it, there's an identity matrix in the middle. Um, so that's the unified derivative equation. And I'll show you later, from this equation, you can derive all these methods uh, for computing derivatives, including the adjoint, direct, um, and also AD. So uh, I decided to take a plunge here and actually try to explain the UDE from scratch, because this is um, a core equation in OpenMDAO. Um, and I think understanding where it comes from, understanding the derivation at least somewhat, uh, might enable you to think of something else, of deriving something else from scratch, okay? So here's to hoping for that. Okay, so let's start with the governing equation. So uh, we have a set of residuals, and this time you are not saying what these are. They're just equations you want to solve, equations that must equal zero. So you have R of a uh, vector U, and you want to vary U until R is zero, okay? Now, we can, I like to have uh, illustrations of things, even though they're oversimplifying a lot, in this case, just 2D, okay? Um, so in this case here, you see that you have uh, residual or lines of constant residual, okay? for residual one and residual two. And residual um, equals zero is the line where the equation is satisfied. So we have the point there, the solution is when R1 equals zero and R2 equals zero simultaneously. And there's a unique point in this case, okay? Uh, now, we can also visualize variations about this residual. If you if residual increases a bit, there's another line corresponding to that, plus minus for each, okay? So that's that. Uh, typically, we don't think in residuals apart from the R equals zero line. But in this case, it's useful to look at variations in it. And you'll see why in a bit. OK. Because now, uh, we'll consider the total differential of the residual. OK? I'll explain later why exactly. Um, but for now, just bear with me here and uh, look at that variation. So the total differential uh, can be written as that uh, uh, sum of the terms, right, for each uh, state variable, u, okay? Um, 
And to visualize that, you, now you can visualize the residual. We're going to zoom in, way in, okay, look at the limit and the linearization of that residual line. Okay, that's why those lines are straight. And then we go look at plus minus. Now we're using differentials because we're looking at the limit. Okay? Um, so now we can write this in matrix form. So now we have this Jacobian, which is the partial derivatives of all residuals with respect to all states, multiplied by a vector that's basically the variation in the state in n-dimensional space, right, equals the variation in residuals. But now you're saying, oh, I know the residuals are zero. Yes, but wait a second, we're linearizing this. So you'll see um, what happens here. So this is relating any variation in the states to variations in residuals, okay? Uh, what does this mean? Um, this means that uh, if you see there in a the figure, we are at the solution, and let's say you vary the residual by a certain amount, okay, to that um, uh, R1 plus dr1. Uh, now we have two variations in du to get there, okay? So we feed the right hand side and we get the column, right? It's a linear system. Right? So if you tell it, I want this variation in residual, or I have this variation in residual, you can get the variation in the states to get there, okay? Uh, basically to, uh, to match that variation. All right, what can we do with this? Well, now we can say, um, put set one residual to, or one variation in residual to non-zero, and everything else to zero. Now we're isolating one component. We're isolating one of the residuals, okay? And then we can divide by that, okay? Mathematicians don't like that, right? Um, but I actually gave this talk in the uh, Department of Mathematics at uh, University of Michigan recently, and one of them said, oh, that's fine. You know, it worked for Newton, it works for us too, right? So you need to take, formally, you need to take the limit and whatnot. Okay, I won't go through all the steps, but this works out. So now we can, you know, again, divide by that dr1, and now what we get is on the right-hand side, a one in that place of the chosen residual, everything else zero, and then we get the vector that you solve for is the total derivatives of the states with respect to the one residual that you chose, okay? Okay, so now we can choose that, do the same for all residuals on the right-hand side. So what you end up with is the identity matrix on the right and the Jacobian of total derivatives, not to be confused with the Jacobian of partial derivatives, okay? And that leads to the forward form of the UDE, okay? Okay, how, how's this useful? Well, some of you know already, right? But um, I'll, I'll get back to that. All right. Now, the neat thing about this uh, equation is actually that you can transpose it, and that leads to the reverse mode of um, the UDE, all right? So that leads to that overall equation. So again, how is this useful, right? Um, so this is useful because you can, and this is the strength of OpenMDAO, is that you can use it to mix implicit and explicit components, okay? So now, let's go back to the system here where we have a box, you feed it at x, you want uh, outcomes in f, you want the derivatives of f with respect to x, total derivatives, okay? And in the middle, you got a implicit solver that's solving for you, and you have a, a function whose evaluation is typically explicit. It's gonna take u and x, which are the design variables, to produce f, all right? Well, now, we define the states as a concatenation of the design variables x, the state variables u, and the functions f, okay? So now u is that concatenation. And the residuals um, are somewhat contrived here because we're taking the, we're considering uh, x, r, and f to be independent variables. We know they really aren't totally independent, but we consider that and we attach it to uh, the actual functions, right? So if you define, the key thing here is that if you define the u and, a, and r this way and apply the unified derivatives equation, this is the, uh, 
matrix equations that you get here at the bottom, okay? Um, and what we want is this total derivative of f with respect to x. So that other junk there after the df dx, the other two columns, they don't really, uh, we don't need that, okay? Mm -hmm. This thing here, we don't need that, um, and we don't need this. So we just need to solve for this column here to get the total derivatives, all right? Okay, um, now if we look at this, this is actually the direct and adjoint methods, okay? Uh, typically, I'd derive the adjoint method another way from scratch, not using the UDE, um, but this yields it. So the only uh, gotcha here is that this the UDX ends up being the, uh, this term in the direct method, right? And the DFDR, so the deriv total derivatives of the objective with respect to the residuals is the adjoint vector, okay? But this ends up being basically these uh, direct and adjoint equations. All right. So I also mentioned that this could also um, get you the AD or algorithmic deficient equations, and here they are. So now we define the, the U's as V's, okay? Uh, and now it's every single variable in the code. So that U, the state variable, is every single variable in the code, and the residual is the difference between what's actually computed and the independent variable. And if you plug that in, you end up with the automatic differentiation, as well as the reverse one for the right-hand side of the UDE. Okay, so now we can actually consider multiple components. So this is what's done in OpenMDAO. Um, so we consider multiple disciplines uh, where things are coupled and there's feedback loops and so on. Um, and now, what we're doing is concatenating the residual vector, so each component has a vector, now I concatenate everything, and once we apply the UDE there, now we get the coupled direct method, okay, and then the coupled adjoint. And this coupled adjoint is uh, uh, what I had come up with uh, many years ago, right? You end up with the same equations. So, uh, what you're using OpenDAO is a coupled direct method or a coupled adjoint, usually the coupled adjoint, um, is favored, um, again, because the cost does not depend on number of variables, so if you have a lot of variables, um, coupled adjoint is the way to go. Okay, so as a quick uh, wing design example, we have, this is basically the, um, um, how open error struct was developed. Uh, we looked at um, circulations and displacements as the coupling variables and so on, and this is what um, that example looks like. Uh, so the N2 diagram there. Okay, well, um, let's talk about how this came up. So the UDE, when um, we first arrived at, I remember presenting a paper um, in uh, Hawaii, I think it was uh, STM conference 2012, and um, um, people thought, people laughed a bit because it was all equations and no results, okay? Uh, it was kind of the derivation, the first derivation of the, the UDE. Uh, and we derived it a slightly different way there. Um, and uh, I, I thought, okay, this is nice and elegant equation, but it is pretty useless, okay? Uh, but I was happy we did it because that's what I wanted. Um, and we got a nice paper out of it. But then uh, John Wang um, started collaborating with a colleague, uh, Professor Jamie Cutler there in Michigan, uh, one of his students in particular, uh, to do a satellite MDO. He saw the problem, really liked the problem, start developing the code to do, and because UDE was fresh in his mind, he started to use some of that structure of the UDE to implement this. And then we found that this is actually very useful as a guide for programming the derivatives and not just that, to, for the solution of the couple problem using the, the couple Jacobian, right? Uh, how to set up all the derivatives and so on. So that's where um, the um, uh, mod was, was, came up. So modular analysis and unified derivatives. Um, and that worked really well. And uh, then um, we started talking to uh, Justin about this and the OpenMDO team about uh, saying, look, you know, this is the way to do 
coupled gradients, and it works really well. Um, and my understanding is also OpenMDAO also implemented the same method with the current um, approaches they had at the time, and uh, then they really saw that this was much faster. So that's when um, Justin went white, apparently. He was telling me yesterday, he was talking to uh, John, uh, because he, why did he go completely white? Because he realized that, oh, we need to change the whole framework, okay? Um, and uh, he'll tell you the details. I'm not sure I can tell you all the details here. But in any case, uh, it got done. And I give Justin a huge amount of credit for uh, really taking the risk, a very risky thing he did to redo all of it uh, to incorporate this. Uh, and I think it uh, really paid off. So um, that was a very, uh, yeah, <laughs> good move. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, so this implementation uh, worked really well and to, to these days now it's implemented in OpenMDAO. Um, and then, of course, uh, a lot of more things were developed and uh, here at NASA and OPM, the team then took this further and developed many newer things. Um, and uh, the rest is, is history, right? Um, so for example, uh, yeah, Jacobin, uh, Jacobin coloring and so on, and the things that were talked about yesterday, uh, all great stuff uh, that came out of this. Some examples, uh, this is one early example with OpenMDAO that uh, John did with uh, uh, John Wang and John Yasa, um, and uh, basically doing allocation, wing design optimization based on CFD, Euler, and trajectory optimization all simultaneously, which was a bit of a crazy big problem. Then uh, Justin um, also worked on the um, integration of CFD and propulsion. He pioneered that in the MDO lab in this PhD, and that was using open MDAO. Um, and then uh, Anil did his thesis, uh, building on top of that, um, simultaneously doing the aerodynamic shape and the propulsor there. And uh, today we are working on now with, the, because that's an electric propulsor, we are uh, also using PyCycle with a turbofan model. And uh, this is uh, an optimization of the, um, of the uh, turbofan shape and sizing together with uh, PyCycle. Um, also open aerostruct uh, was something that um, uh, I wanted to develop because I wanted a more accessible aerostructural optimization. So um, I'm really happy to see uh, how many different uh, uses open aerostruct has had um, over the years. Something we're uh, working on uh, currently also is the uh, uh, open concept, uh, which is uh, which started for uh, looking at electric aircraft systems. Uh, and optimizing uh, electric aircraft. Um, so this is all using OpenMDO. This one as well, uh, Bernardo, and uh, together with uh, Professor Karthik Duraisami, we're working on um, coupling air acoustics with uh, CFD for uh, uh, EV tall aircraft. And there are many other applications. This table is from our OpenMDO paper, but there's been many, many other since. So, um, so this uh, brings us to this um, called circle of impact. Um, I think it's really important to have this interaction between theory, implementation, applications. Um, and that's because, you know, a lot of times uh, students or people come to me, oh, you know, I want to work on this, it's really neat. Uh, and um, I think, well, you know, there are many interesting and neat things, but only some of them are useful. Uh, at least immediately. You know, something like, and well, I have to think back, the UDE did seem use, useless at the time. So there are some things that might seem useless that then become useful, okay? Uh, but I'd rather bet on the things that look like they have a high probability of, of being useful. Um, and then there's the implementation. So implementation, I think, has been undervalued historically um, in academia. Uh, but I found it really important to convince people that it works. So, for example, in this case, it took a decent implementation of MOD 
to convince NASA, uh, or the OPM, the team in particular, that this is useful and, and works well, right? Then with OpenMDAO, then you have a much more robust, much uh, more general implementation, right? But that having that prototype implementation that worked well enough was important. Same thing with the MAC framework and doing aerosol optimization. It took that second implementation that was more efficient where we could do a big problem to tell industry, to show to industry, look, this, is, this has potential, right? And it was only after that that I got funded from, from industry, okay? Uh, and then the applications, for me, it's been very, uh, always humbling to deal with, uh, you know, the uh, OpenMDO team or uh, industry where you see some more realistic applications and then you learn from them. And then you close the circle and decide, okay, we need new theory in this, that, or the other, right? Um, I also think it's really important to have things open, um, and uh, that's why I made my uh, book for free. I uh, get a lot of uh, queries from all over the world about MDO and so on, and I know a lot of people can't afford the book, a uh, $100 book, so I provide the PDF for free there. And it has a lot of the theory um, that you need for optimization. Um, of course, OpenMDO being an open source project, I think was a, a, big, um, a big coup there that uh, uh, Justin arranged. Um, yeah, and I want to thank all the, all the sponsors, uh, and especially NASA funded a lot of this work. So uh, go forth and optimize. Thank you very much, Kim. Uh, I, uh, I I helped contribute to the to the to the book, and I, I enjoyed uh, reviewing it. So, uh, if you haven't seen that already, uh, at least at least go download that PDF. I mean, it's fantastic. That, that's so. literally Elliot's favorite book. It it, it really <laughs> is. It really is. I was on the pre-order list for that. It was it was very exciting. So, I'm happy to add that to my library. Yeah, it's uh, a very good one. Speaking of which, I um, so Justin wrote a nice blog post about. This, this is a bit more detail. Um, I'll provide the slides. This is basically the way I see it, uh, the most useful sections and chapter for OpenMDO users. Um, and of course, there's a lot more detail that's not needed, but those, I think, are uh, useful in particular for um, OpenMDO, uh, because the whole thing is kind of geared toward, it's sort of biased towards uh, the OpenMDO way of doing things. All right, do we have any, uh, we, we, we have five minutes for questions for Keem? Anyone have a question? Uh, what are some of the uh, unsolved problems in the field that you guys are working on? Yeah, so um, one of them was already mentioned yesterday, it's, uh, you know, how do you do unsteady, right? Um, so we're doing some work on it. I'm working with uh, uh, Ping uh, on that. We have an NSF project on that. Um, another one, and this is not so much of a problem for me to solve. Maybe, maybe not. This, uh, I've been working a lot with industry and uh, trying to transition a lot this to industry, but there's still issues. Um, you know, somebody mentioned GUIs, industry wants GUIs. I understand why I'm not as, um, I disagree maybe a bit with Justin, what he said yesterday. Um, I think, yeah, I've undervalued GUIs in the past and I, I see from my little experience of developing some GUIs how much impact uh, that can have. Um, but that's not what I agree with Justin on, is not, not academia's job, maybe not NASA's job, to do that, so that needs to be maybe a company that needs to uh, develop that to the point where industry is usable by industry more widely. Um, another is uh, related to that is, um, yeah, how, how do you make an interface that's uh, simple enough and, and where the code works robustly enough for it to be easy in industry, right? Um, Interacting with industry now is like a lot of, needs a lot of help, 
right? Um, so that, that's an unsolved problem, but that's not a, a technical, it's, it's more of a software development, yeah. A lot of the professors in MDO have very good students who are graduating that industry should hire. <laughs> so why is, in your opinion, why is MDA so much in the aero field and not so much in, in other kinds of applications? Yeah, and same reason why finite elements were invented by um, aeronautical engineers. And the reason is weight is at the premium, right? Uh, more than any other um, engineering system. And so it pays off to invest in design methods because you can't afford a factor of 10, you know. Uh, you need to go with, you know, 1.2 or, or less. Um, so it really pays to, to invest in not just design methods, but also materials and so on. That's why aerospace, yeah, it, tends to be the, the leading edge of uh, uh, in engineering system design. Does that answer your question, or what are you looking for something else? To other domains. So what, 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 is the, what are the barriers to expanding MDA capabilities to other kinds of applications, in your opinion? Yeah, so, well, one I already mentioned, which is the accessibility of the software, but also um, education knowing about it, uh, if you look back on when CFD started, right? When CFD started, yeah, people in industry didn't know about CFD. Uh, they were skeptical. Uh, they just didn't know what it could do. Um, and some were, frankly, afraid that CFD would replace aerodynamics. So aerodynamics were afraid of that. Um, and I think we might be in a similar situation now, right? Um, but now things are changing because now there are more and more um, courses on MDO and optimization, the, uh, engineering design optimization. Um, so education on that is improving. Uh, and again, that was a big motivation for me to, to write this book and make it free. Um, so yeah, I would say uh, that would be a barrier. And then more practical issues about you know how to use software and so on, which is not uh, how to make more practical software. Um, another barrier, I would say, is problem formulation. Right now, you know, in MDO is a very, um, very, um, very prescriptive. So we have a very, um, uh, there's one way to define the problem. You have objective, you have constraints and design variables. But maybe there's a more flexible way of doing that right, um, that, um, that is more practical, right? So um, my students and I get caught up on, okay, we want to find the optimum and it needs to satisfy the KKT conditions, right? Um, but in practice, you don't actually need that. You just need to get uh, a better result by the deadline, right? Uh, and I struggle even with my students, you know, to get some result. <laughs> Something is better than nothing, right? So. Um, if you don't get uh, the optimum, it might be okay, right? All right, thank you very much, Kim. That's uh, the extent of the time that we have. For, uh, if you have any questions later on, please, please ask them. Um, uh, with that, um, thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. And